So the question that's the central question in my research and my work is a kind of obvious question, which is, why do we have children at all? Okay, not the obvious answer, which even in Silicon Valley, probably most of you have figured out, but why is it that we have such a long period of immaturity and helplessness? Why do we have these costly children? And this is a particularly relevant question for humans because we have the longest childhood of any species. So this is a chimp in the Gombe, and by the time that chimps are seven years old, they're producing as much food as they're consuming. Even in forager cultures, human children aren't doing that till they're 15, and my son is 30, and in our culture, it can be even later than that. <laughs> this is a very distinctive feature of what biologists call our life history. And if you go to evolutionary biologists, life history is one of the really central concepts in uh, explaining how it is that we came to be the kind of creatures that we are. So we have a very bizarre life history. We have this very extended long childhood and a tremendous amount of investment that has to go into keeping those children alive and functioning. Not just mothers, but uh, grandparents, fathers, parents, etc. Um, so why is this? Why is it that our babies are so useless and helpless and we have to spend so long taking care of them? Well, it turns out that if you, occasionally even our 30-year-olds, uh, it turns out that if you actually look across many, many different species, you see this really striking correlation between life history and learning. And we have a, a new paper coming out in Phil Trans about this. So if you look at uh, the amount of childhood, the amount of immaturity, it's highly correlated with brain size and learning and flexibility and what we might anthropomorphically think of as intelligence in the adult animals. And kind of the poster animals for this are actually birds. So our friend the domestic chicken <laughs> is basically as dumb as a stump, very good at kick picking for brain, not very good at learning anything new. Compare that with something like this new Caledonian crow, as smart as a chimpanzee, incredibly flexible. The, uh, chimp, the chicken is mature in about two weeks. The crows don't fledge until they're about two years old. So there's a lot of investment going on in taking care of these animals. And this is a chart that shows the same thing for primates. You can see the same thing for a very wide range of, um, of animals, even uh, among insects. So the puzzle is, why would you see this relationship between having a long period, costly period of immaturity, and then being smart when you're an adult? Well, it turns out that if you look at the neuroscience, you can see some uh, evidence for these same kinds of changes across childhood. So this is a, uh, looking at the number of synaptic connections across time, across childhood. And what you can see is that there's these two very distinct periods of development. So there's an early period when many, many new connections are being formed. And then about seven, there's a kind of tipping point where the connections that are formed get to be stronger, more efficient, more effective. But many connections are actually lost. So many connections are pruned. And similarly, you see um, this late development of the prefrontal cortex, the sort of planning part of the brain, you've heard about this before, and an early period when that kind of prefrontal control doesn't seem to be in place, and a later period when it is. And what this suggests is that there's something qualitatively different about the brain in childhood and the brain in adulthood. It isn't just that the brain in childhood is sort of a defective grown-up brain, it's actually a different brain designed to do something else. So then the question becomes, why would you have this architecture? Interestingly, it's not an architecture you see in most AI, for example. Why would you have an architecture of an early system that's very plastic, that's very flexible, that is very sensitive to experience, and then this later system that's very efficient, not very plastic, not very flexible, not very good at learning? Um, and I think the answer to that comes from thinking about uh, computation. And in particular, at Berkeley, uh, we've been looking at children as a model for designing AI. We've just got a big DARPA grant, and if you look in the Wall Street Journal that's in, your, in the hotel, uh, there's a cover essay that I did just yesterday uh, explaining some of, some of these ideas that are treating children as models for, um, treating children as models for AI. Now, a very foundational problem in AI and computation is what's called the exploitation versus exploration trade-off. So if you look at a very wide range of systems, what you see is that you can't maximize both your ability to act effectively, to exploit, to be goal-directed, to optimize, to get things done, and your ability to explore a space of possibilities. And you can prove that you can't get a system that can do both of those things at the same time 
You can also prove that the best way of solving that trade-off is to start out with a period of wide-ranging exploration um, and plasticity, start out looking at the high-level features of the space, and then gradually cool off to a more focused, um, more exploit kind of strategy. And in the context of computation optimization theory, this is called simulated annealing. And what we've argued and empirically shown is that something like this is happening with childhood. So childhood is a protected period in which you can do this kind of broad, general exploration of possibility. Um, and what we've shown is that, in fact, <coughs> sorry, if you give children and adults problems, you know, most of the time ch adults are going to be better than children. But if you give them problems that require finding a solution that's not the obvious solution, finding an unlikely solution, that children actually outperform adults. Um, and we found this across a whole wide range of different domains, and other people have found similar things. So if you're thinking about a problem that involves wide-ranging exploration of a space, you have a very different picture than one that involves exploitation. And in particular, many things that are bugs from the perspective of ex exploitation are actually features from the perspective of exploration. So many of the things that we traditionally think we kind of have to beat out of little kids, their noisiness, their variability, their randomness, their impulsivity, their curiosity, their play, um, those are actually features from the perspective of exploration. And an important practical question is, how can we uh, have, say, early childhood education that supports these kinds of features as opposed to attempting to, to turn the children into the uh, exploit-efficient prefrontal adults? Um, so that's one of the things that we're worried about at, at Berkeley. So, then the question becomes, what's it like to be one of these creatures? What's it like to be a creature with this kind of wide-ranging plasticity in learning, um, a creature who has these features of noisiness and randomness and curiosity? And I've argued for a couple of different analogies you might have to what consciousness is like in such a creature. But very recently, we've, there's been a remarkable uh, bunch of work which suggests a very striking and kind of unexpected analogy. And that's all of this work that's been done on the effects of psychedelics uh, in imaging and in neuroscience. And essentially, what you see, and most of the psychedelic in investigators have argued for the same thing, essentially you see that what the effect of psychedelics is to return the brain to this childhood state of plasticity and openness. So this is actually a cell. I think the cell does not actually become tie-dyed, but as you can see, it <laughs> develops um, it develops more of these. Uh, it develops more of these neural connections. Um, this is a, a slide showing that under the influence of something like psilocybin, you have many more local connections and fewer of these pruned long-distance connections. So this is just the opposite of what you would see in the course of uh, of development. Um, and uh, Robin Carhart Harris and his colleagues have shown that those prefrontal control systems that we think are so great and are really great if you actually have to go out into the world and do things, actually become deactivated under the influence of, uh, of psychedelics. So if you think about childhood, childhood, I mean, it looks as if what the psychedelics are doing is putting your brain back into a neurological state, and I think also an experiential state, a phenomenological state, which is like that state of advanced plasticity um, and exploration that you see <laughs> in childhood. And I think any of you who've hung out with babies or three-year-olds, this will kind of make sense. Um, there's a lot. You could sort of summarize baby consciousness by saying it's a lot of, oh, wow, right? There's a lot of, oh, wow, for babies. Um, and what I've argued is if you think about consciousness and attention, and there's lots more science about this that I could talk about, um, in adults as being like a kind of spotlight, something that comes in and just illuminates particular things that are going on around you, in childhood and in infancy, you should think of it as being more like a lantern. So even though children, you know, one thing is when we say that children are bad at paying attention, what we really mean is they're bad at not paying attention. So they're seeing more of the world around them than an adult is when an adult is focused on a particular, uh, a particular outcome. Now, I know that there's a lot of interest in this room about psychedelics a lot of interest in psychedelics in general. But I think it's worth pointing out that if we're thinking about how could we have creatures who are plastic and open and open to experience and able to learn, we don't have to have psychedelics to do that. And we don't need to have fancy AI. We've actually got them all around. They're babies and young children. 
and 20% of them in America are growing up in poverty. So I think the first priority ought to be to actually support the evolutionarily determined romantic, crazy, wild, trippy creatures in our midst, namely the children that we have. So one piece is explore, exploit. I think the third piece is care. Exploration and exploitation can only work if you have uh, caregiving investment, only work if individuals and a society is actually there to take care of those explorers. So um, I'll mention my, my own protectors and collaborators um, and hope that we can talk some at lunch. Thank you.